that any of you thought that I was Malcolm and Betty's only daughter. I'd never hear the end of it. So you heard it here. I am one of six daughters, and I honor and love each of my five sisters dearly. To the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, to your executive director, Dwayne Clark Crawford, thank you for this invitation to fellowship with you, your families, friends, and award recipients. Can the organizers for this brunch please stand so we can give you a round of applause? for getting all of us here today safely. May we also arrive back home safely, further committed to our individual and collective purpose. I'd also like to give praise to our ancestors, our foreparents, the refined and industrious men and women of African ancestry, where our human family traces its foundation, Black, indigenous people of color who have not been honored in history, those whose stories have been omitted, rewritten, and improperly documented. We give praise to the countless men and women who birthed thriving civilizations of antiquity, glory, honor, and grace, whose culture was of a universal spirit and intellect, God and scholarship who migrated the world over before Christopher Columbus was even a thought. <laughs> and yet those of their descendants who endured physical and psychological traumas, those who endured the largest forced migration of a people in the history of humankind, refined and industrious, men, women, and children, those who were targeted, trafficked, held in bondage against their will, and forced to make new nations wealthy without merit, compensation, or respect for human life. Can we give them praise? Because in spite of it all, we are still here standing and we prosper. We are strong, we are vigilant, and we are interconnected as a human family. Amen? Amen. We are by no means the first generation to be haunted by injustice. However, we know that it is our responsibility to, re to resolve these injustices continually committed against us. We understand that each and every one of us will be held accountable to our maker for how we respond to our life experience, for the choices we make when. When we look filled with hatred and bigotry, it's easy to lose hope and give in to despair. It's easy to believe change will never happen but rather than see ourselves as a defeated minority, let us see ourselves as the majority of goodwill stewards united to get this boot off of our necks. On February 21st, 1965, my mother, five sisters, and I witnessed the assassination of her young husband, our father, Malcolm X. My pregnant mother, placed her entire body over my three sisters and me to protect us from gunfire and to make sure we would not see the terror before our eyes. Just a week prior, Malcolm and Betty lay in bed together asleep as husband and wife when a firebomb was thrown in the nursery of our home where their babies, my sisters and I, aged six, four, two, and not quite one year old, lay asleep. My father was 39 years old and my mother was 29, pregnant with my youngest sisters, the twins. And despite having witnessed her husband's political assassination, this young woman never gave in to bitterness or despair, even though as a young wife and mother, many would say that she
she had every right. But you see, had my young mother become a victim after enduring such tragedy, I would not be standing here with you today. She did not live her life as a victim. Her motto was find the good and praise it, else life will pass you by. The Malcolm you learned about in your youth is not the Malcolm we've come to know in his truth. Rather, this young woman, Sister Betty, protecting her husband's work, she safeguarded his legacy so that his work could be realized by this generation. She kept her husband's essence integral in our single parent households. She did not want her six daughters to suffer from the abrupt loss of our father's physical presence and love. And though he was physically absent, my mother made sure her husband remained present in our household conversations for as long as I can remember. Daddy would be proud of you, she said. I knew my father loved me. I remember his beautiful smile, his love of jazz music, literature, poetry. That he was a student of history, religion, nature, the arts. Brothers, my mother had photos and paintings of her husband everywhere in our home. He was a dashing and handsome Renaissance man, ladies. that you could trust, and you knew he had your back, and I knew him to be wise and with impeccable integrity. You see, Malcolm was ultimately led by his service to God. From such a foundation, my values were formed. It was only in college that I began to hear inaccurate portrayals of my father's character and his life's work. I now understand why my mother protected us from the negative and false depictions of this warm and gentle icon, Malcolm X, so that his legacy and work could be accurately realized for the benefit of this generation. You see, my father burst onto the civil rights movement as a young man in his 20s. The climate in America was antithetical to the humanity of black brown and female Americans, systemically miseducated, and who saw themselves as minorities, living their entire lives in constant terror, traumatized, and destitute, without hope or protection from their own country. It is a familiar sentiment to many of us. And so the challenge, brothers and sisters, in emphasizing human rights my father was saying that our capacity to care for one another must reach beyond ethnicity, gender, and religion. That it is our moral compass that reveals injustice. And whether in the educational system or the criminal justice system, it is our moral compass that enables us to work toward justice. And so to this Noble organization, we salute you. We salute you. Let's please give you guys a round of applause. And so we gather here in New Orleans. If you travel a mile or two up Tulane Avenue, you'll find a plaque outside the parish criminal district court that is dedicated to Judge Israel Augustine Jr. And many of us do not know who he is. But Judge Israel Augustine is one of the first black district judges in Louisiana post Reconstruction. Judge Augustine exemplified your mission to ensure equity in the administration of justice. During the famous Black Panther trial of 1970 as the presiding judge, one can only imagine the immense pressure and threats he faced. Yet his courage to ensure a fair trial, despite the politically charged atmosphere, embodies what it means to be the conscience of law enforcement. 
judge Augustine's actions, remind us that justice requires moral courage. You need faith in God, and it requires unwavering integrity, even in the face of adversity. Augustine's legacy challenges us to stand firm in our principles, and to be, as my father would say, a torch bearer of truth in our pursuit of justice. Our faith is underpinned by hope. Hope in God, hope in the goodness of humanity, hope for a better tomorrow. In our collective struggle for social justice, we will be met with obstacles and challenges, but this is to be expected because if we have the audacity to still believe in hope, then we know that we will be tested. And as Psalm 35 indicates, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen? So let us become a community of optimists who don't see the glass half empty. We see that glass half full. We see opportunity and calamity and sunshine after every storm. That in times of darkness, we are not only called to find the light for ourselves, we are called to be the light for others. My mother would say optimism alone is not enough. We also need courage. And it was my father's moral courage that enabled him to speak truth to power. You see, he didn't fear man because he served our almighty God. Amen. Moral courage is required to remain focused and steadfast on our principles. Maya Angelou said courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage, one cannot practice any other virtue consistently. And so today, the struggles we face may have new names, but at their core, they are the same old systemic injustices. Systemic inequality continues to harm communities. Institutional racism continues to devastate families. Socioeconomic disparities continue to ruin lives. And this is why Noble seeks to ensure equity in the administration of justice. And so we have optimism, courage, and we must also ask ourselves, what does our future look like? How can we be more strategic and organized in our efforts? How can we create that checklist to ensure we are accomplishing our shared, identified, and measurable goals? We stay focused on who we are fighting for and not what we are fighting against. We are building more bridges and fewer walls. My father said when we face divisiveness, which tries to convince us that we must choose one over the other, we must choose to come together. I think the power of community after my father and Dr. King were politically assassinated. My mother and Aunt Coretta Scott King became best of friends. Bernice King and I are also sister friends. The Shabazz Center was inspired in part by the King Center, and so we are not rivals. We are sisters.
have a child, I remember every Wednesday, Sheikh Ahmed Tawfiq would come to our home and teach us about the significant contribution that women, the African diaspora, and Islam made to the world. We learned about the oneness of God, hence the oneness of humanity. We learned to truly love ourselves so that we never relied on others to determine our self-worth. Today, it allows me to see you as a reflection of me and me as a reflection of you. To love you just as much as I learned to love myself. If I learn to love me, then I can also love you. If I don't love me, I can never love you, and I will never be of any help to you. When we don't learn this lesson, we get caught in the cycle of division and self-destruction. And this is why self-love and civic engagement were central in my family household. My parents' lessons are relevant now more than ever. My prayer is that this moment will produce present and future generations of problem solvers who take a holistic approach to human rights, recognizing that each of us is called to be an agent of change. And so to the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this is our moment right now, each and every one of us to bring about change. We can achieve change, justice, and love when as a united front, we understand the number one rule, we must act together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. <laughs> together. <laughs> Dr. King said, those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. And so it is our responsibility to build and organize community networks, to stand up for those who cannot stand for themselves, and to make our voices heard, as my father said, by any means necessary. Amen. 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 And now, the activist, Daddy Lou Hamer said, we are in this bag together, educated and uneducated, rich and poor, women and men, when we understand that collective action matters more than individual action, we can dream new dreams and create a world that makes our communities resonate with the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. My father said it would be this generation who recognized that those in power have misused it and demand change, and this is what leadership looks like. It looks like you. It looks like us. Historically, our foreparents advocated against injustice, and we salute you, Noble, for carrying forth our rich legacy. Because when we understand that we can only win together, we will stop focusing on what divides us in the midst of tragedies and triumphs and write the next chapter of our human story with optimism, courage, and futuristic thinking. When we bear witness to the community over chaos, we are empowered by the truth that each one of us is a beautiful creation destined to shine our light in community for the greater good. Thank you and God bless you.